Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of our Seven Investing podcast. I'm Seven Investing founder and CEO Simon Erickson. You've probably heard quite a bit about the ad tech market lately. This is an industry that's been growing on fire. It's taking off at exponential growth rates, and it's extremely exciting to speak with one of the innovators in the field. I'm joined this afternoon by Rajiv Goel. He is the co-founder and CEO of Pubmatic. That is P-U-B-M is the ticker on that company, publicly traded company. Hey, Rajiv, I'm really excited to chat with you about ad tech. Thanks for joining me on the 7 Investing Podcast today. Thanks, Simon. Great to be here with you and, and excited to be here with your viewers, your audience. Rajiv, I know you're joining me from Silicon Valley this morning. That's home sweet home for you. And I know a little bit about your backstory that you grew up talking about technology around the dinner table. What led you to start Pubmatic in the first place? And what are your goals for the company? Yeah, you're exactly right. So, you know, I grew up uh, here in Silicon Valley. Both of my parents uh, worked in tech. They're, they're now retired. Uh, and so that was the, the dinner table conversation. Uh, and in fact, when I was in college, I started my first company along with uh, one of my co-founders here at Pubmatic. Uh, my brother, and that was an e-commerce uh, focused company in the golf space. Uh, and it was a, a great business, uh, had a lot of fun. And then we ran into the 2000 and, you know, 2001, uh, you know, maelstrom and, uh, and we got blown out of the water. Uh, but we learned a lot of valuable lessons in that process. And I knew at that point that, you know, running, running my own company was, was kind of the thing for me. But I spent about another five years working at other large companies, SAP, uh, consulting at Allstate, um, Kraft Foods, just to try to learn as much as I could. So I spent a lot of time in product and engineering and sales and marketing. Uh, and then in 2005, 2006, uh, I uh, decided, okay, t time to get back into, into, uh, into the startup world. And, and I started Pomatic. That's fantastic. 2006. So you're a 15 year old. You're a teenager as a company right now. That's young for a lot of companies, but in Silicon Valley, you've been around, you've seen some war stories and got some experience out there. And I know that you've kind of seen this advertising industry change quite a bit over the last decade and a half. Uh, where, where have you seen this evolve in the last 15 years? And then where do we stand in, in digital advertising today? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're, we're in some ways, I feel old, uh, to, to your point, uh, in terms of the company's age. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've seen, I think, a, a significant number of, of innovations and really changes in what I would characterize as a pretty dynamic industry. The digital advertising industry. So the first uh, is the advent of real-time bidding, right? And so real-time bidding obviously is the primary way that digital ads are transacted now. And we were really a, a pioneer and innovator in this. We did some of the first real-time bidding transactions back in 2009 uh, with the startup that was called Invite Media, which uh, was acquired by Google and is the foundation of their, uh, you know, very large now uh, demand side platform. Um, so the shift from kind of static methods of buying to bidded media, right? 100 millisecond, 150 millisecond auctions. So that was one big shift. I think the second big shift that we've seen is from uh, desktop devices to mobile devices, right? So today, obviously consumers consume the vast majority of, of media content and then and therefore advertising on mobile devices. And you know that's a, a huge technological shift. And I think now we're in the midst really of the next big shift on that level, which is around audience addressability uh, and consumer privacy, right? So we're moving away from anonymous uh, data, third-party cookie, the Apple ID for advertising or IDFA, and towards uh, known user uh, and consumer opt-in, uh, known user targeting and, and consumer opt-in. And, and I think that's a, just a huge sea change and great opportunity for us. Let's double click on that identity in a minute here, Rajiv. I'd like to get back to that a little later on, but sure. just to kind of start at the, at the higher level and talk a little bit more about the market. Uh, you just re reported your results. Revenue was up 54% and the number of impressions up 106%. By the way, fantastic job on that. You know, for, six, for a 15 year old company, that's still kind of startup growth numbers. Uh, it, are we still in the earliest innings of programmatic advertising? And if so, who, who, what kind of industries or customers of yours are, are just now starting to embrace this? Yeah, I think, you know, in many ways, uh, as large as the industry is, it's still, it's still fairly early and, and dynamic. Uh, so if we think about, you know, what, what the industry looks like, you know, there's about a three quarters uh, of a trillion dollars of total global ad spend, right? And so that's digital as well as non-digital. Digital is about two thirds of that if we go out a couple of years. And then the programmatic portion, right? So that's using automation, that's data, real-time bidding, that uh, is itself uh, the majority of, of that digital ad spend. 
So we operate in about a, a 250 billion-ish, 300 billion dollar uh, market. It's growing, you know, 10 to 12 percent a year. Uh, and some parts of it are certainly growing faster. If we look at it from a, a kind of a format or device perspective, you know, we've seen a steady progression. First, desktop conversion to digital and, and programmatic, then mobile web, mobile app, online video, and now you know the the single um, the, the the one of the fastest growing categories is over the top streaming and connected TV devices. From an advertiser vertical perspective, you know I would say all verticals are major programmatic advertisers, but we absolutely are seeing in, in our business reopening strength and recovery across a number of different verticals like food and drink, style and fashion, automotive. You know, these are, are verticals that were obviously hit hard uh, in, in the last 12 months around the pandemic, but we started to see, you know, significant growth in spend on our platform in, uh, in Q1. And you all represent the supply side of this ad tech industry, right? You're working with the publishers, people that want to publish content on their site or wherever they have it. Um, so they get the highest rates that, uh, from advertisers that want to place those based on the audience. Is it ROI that's the driver of business for you all? What is the real key for why people want to go programmatic? Yeah, so you're, you're absolutely right that we operate on the sell side. And, and maybe I'll just spend you know, a couple of seconds on that. You know, uh, our, uh, our mission is really to fuel the endless potential of internet content creators. And we do that by delivering to, to content creators a more profitable digital advertising business so that they can reinvest back into all of the great content experiences journalism, entertainment, you know, TV, et cetera, that, that we all love uh, on the internet. And so our, our uh, uh, content creator customers are companies like News Corp, eBay, Zynga, uh, and we help them connect in with the, the largest media buyers like a WPP and IPG and, and Procter and & Gamble. And so the buyers of, of advertising, the agencies and the advertisers, they absolutely are looking for really ROI, right? Or return on ad spend. So they wanna put a, a dollar uh, of ad budget to work and they want to know that they're getting, you know, measurable return around that. And that's typically uh, conversion. You know, maybe you sign up for a credit card offer or something like that, or it could be brand impact. You know, you discover uh, a new brand that perhaps you didn't know before. Uh, and then obviously on the publisher side, again, it all comes down to generating more revenue from that ad space that they have in their apps and in their websites so that they can reinvest back into content creation. Sure. And I know the Pubmatic, when you started it, publisher and automatic, right? You want to make this as automated as possible out there. Um, it's a very fragmented industry, at least from what I've seen. How do you differentiate yourself from other uh, sell-side platforms that are available? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there, there is a, a level of fragmentation. I think we're at a uh, point in the industry now where we're seeing significant consolidation happening. Uh, just as, you know, there's been consolidation on the buy side of the ecosystem with demand side platforms. So the, the primary way that we differentiate is that, number one, we own and operate uh, all of our own ad serving infrastructure around the world. So we're processing uh, on the level of about 200 billion ad impressions uh, per day. So just in the short time that we've been talking, you know, we probably processed uh, somewhere around a billion ads, if, if you can believe that. Uh, and by owning our own infrastructure, which means the networking infrastructure, the hardware and the software, uh, we're able to, to generate superior customer outcomes, right? The alternative is that you use public cloud providers, right? And there's obviously many large uh, or a handful of large cloud providers. But the challenge with that is that then you only own the software, right? You're sitting in their network environment, you're sitting in their hardware environment, right? And you, you don't have control over that. And because programmatic advertising is real time and it's data intensive, we think it's really important to own, you know, that, that full set of infrastructure capabilities. Now, what we're also able to do, in addition to generate better customer outcomes, is that we can be much more efficient, right? We can leverage that, that network investment, that hardware investment to really bring efficiency to the market. And that allows us to be very transparent and also to innovate at a faster pace. And transparency is important because the industry has, has had a history of opacity. And so buyers and publishers alike, they want to know, hey, what are you doing with my media inventory? And what are you doing with my ad budgets on the buy side? And so we're able to be very transparent and that generates a level of profitability that then we can reinvest back into innovation, right? And, and innovation is important because the industry is so dynamic. And I think you see this in our results, you know, the growth rate uh, that we're putting up uh, over 30% is our forecast for this year. Uh, you know, terrific, I think uh, adjusted EBITDA margins, you know, also around 30%, but also, you know, if you look below that, you know, strong net income and cash flow. 
Uh, and so we are growing significantly faster than others in the market and we're significantly more profitable. Yeah, and it sounds like you have a level of control over your infrastructure too that perhaps others that are using those public cloud providers don't quite have. Yeah, that's exactly right. And again, that is key to, to driving great customer outcomes, right? And if you can obviously drive better customer outcomes, uh, then you can generate you know, more, uh, more benefit, more value for your customers uh, and capture a portion of that. And I think a great metric that captures that for us is uh, in uh, the trailing 12 months through the end of the last quarter, uh, we had 130% net dollar-based retention, right? And so you know, that's, a, I think, a, just a phenomenal stat in terms of how much value our, our customers are getting from our platform. That's very, very high. That's an excellent metric for anyone for, who's unfamiliar to that, uh, listening to this podcast. That's kind of explains that a, a customer that spent $100 previously with Pubmatic was spending $130 today. Great upsell opportunity, great retention with your customers. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship with the demand side, with the platforms that are kind of being built out? How do you choose who to partner with on the DSPs? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we think on the buy side, we think about it in terms of, of course, DSPs, right? They're the kind of the counterparty that's integrated into our platform and, and bidding, but also advertisers and agencies. So from a, a DSP perspective, you know, we, we are uh, integrated with something like 100 demand side platforms. And so we're really focused on any demand side platform that has high quality ads uh, and that are, you know, I would say long-term viable, right? And so we have some global omni-channel uh, demand side platform partners like the Trade Desk uh, in Google. We have geographic specific uh, DSPs, you know, maybe Japan only or Central Europe only. And then we have some ad format or device specific uh, DSP partners. You know, maybe they're buying only mobile app inventory. So there may be a specialist there or, or in CTV. Uh, and then I think one of the key things that, that uh, we innovated in and, and really pioneered is this concept of supply path optimization or helping advertisers and agencies really consolidate to a more efficient and effective digital advertising supply chain. Uh, and, you know, I, I talked about transparency earlier, but, you know, we also sit on top of a lot of data, you know, through our auction platform. And so there's a number of things that we can do to help the, the advertisers and the agencies in conjunction with their DSP partner uh, to generate, you know, more return on, on ad spend. So Rajiv, is it a fair statement to say that the industry was so fragmented at the beginning because so much of this was specific on a customer by customer basis, right? You had publishers that wanted to advertise on even certain devices or certain channels or wherever it was, but then as they kind of get larger and larger and on the channel over time, uh, you're able to provide them more information from the data you're collecting to make it more efficient on how they're overall spending their ads. I mean, sorry, how they're making their, uh, their sites available for advertisement from agencies. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. So, you know, when I think about our customer base, so I mentioned a couple of the publisher customers, right? News Corp, eBay, Zynga. These are global companies and they're also multi-platform companies, right? So you might interact with News Corp content, uh, you know, Wall Street Journal or, you know, Barron's, et cetera, on a mobile device. You might watch uh, TV shows that they have, you know, streaming content. You might do it on your laptop, you know, in the office or, or at home. Uh, and so a company like that, they want, you know, a global omni-channel platform uh, that can help them monetize their, their audience and their inventory around the world and across all of those ad formats. In a similar fashion on the buy side, you know, we might be working with uh, WPP uh, or Procter & Gamble in addition to, uh, or via, you know, our DSP partner like the Trade Desk or Google. And those brands and those agencies are, of course, global as well, right? They have products that they're advertising in, you know, hundreds of markets around the world. Uh, and so they also want global uh, omni-channel platforms. Uh, and so I think we are, you know, quite unique in terms of the, the breadth and the scale that we have. You know, we have eight data centers around the world. We, you know, have offices around the world. We do business in, in dozens of countries. Um, so I think we're pretty unique in, in our ability to really help these customers be more efficient and, and do that at scale. And that is a, a key driver of consolidation that we see in the market. That makes a ton of sense to me. Rajiv, I did want to follow up with a, something that you mentioned earlier about kind of a data privacy is such a hot topic these days, right? It's always in the headlines. Um, we know that a lot of these publishers are international, but we've also seen huge differences in how different regions across the world approach and think about privacy, right? China's internet is very different than Europe's internet, which is very different than America's internet. We saw GDPR in Europe, you know, there's kind of a, a a lot of discussion about data privacy in the United States as well. Do you think that advertising uh, is, is regional, uh, first of all, in kind of how different areas of the globe approach it? And then how does that kind of impact 
how you approach customers or think about scaling this programmatic advertising opportunity? Yeah, so I, I think the common thread or the global thread maybe is that consumers are much more aware of how their data is being used uh, on the internet now than you know they were aware maybe three or four years ago, right? And obviously there's been a lot of things that have happened, elections in the past, you know, data leaks, things like that. Uh, and that has led to, I think, a much higher degree of awareness on the part of the consumer. Now, to your point, obviously, uh, regulations are quite different around the world, right? In Europe, we have uh, the general data protection uh, uh, regulation, GDPR. You know, here in the U.S., there's a lot of fragmentation. California, where I am, has uh, the CCPA. I won't, you know, bother to, to spell it out. You know, there's legislation pending in, uh, you know, Virginia and Rhode Island and other states. And then Australia, other parts of Asia have taken, you know, totally different approaches. Uh, but I think what's common across that is uh, the, the, the targeting that's happened anonymously in the background without the consumer being aware that it was happening is now shifting towards giving the consumer voice in that decision. And so consumers now have, have a role to play in this, which is to say, hey, I'm okay to get uh, to, to have targeted ads and my data will be used to, to provide targeted ads, or I'm not okay with that, right? And the consumer now is also being reminded that, hey, you're getting free media, you're getting free content, and these services, you know, there's a cost, right? You might like a weather app, for instance, or, you know, news articles, uh, or a TV show. Obviously, all of those things, you know, cost money to, to produce uh, and to put on, you know, on your phone or on your laptop. And so if you don't want to participate in it, then, you know, maybe you won't get the content. And, but again, it's great that it's a conscious decision for the consumer. So I think this is a, a big change. And the key part where it comes to advertisers and publishers now is that uh, advertisers will have the ability in the future to combine great quality content. So think about, again, content from a News Corp or a Zynga, along with the ability to know who the consumer is and deliver a targeted relevant ad where the consumer has said, I'm open to doing that. Uh, and that has not existed in the past, right? In the past, what advertisers have had is they've had the ability to target the consumer, but it's typically been in a user-generated environment, you know, like a, uh, a Facebook or a YouTube. Um, and so they have not had, advertisers have not had that great combination of, I can deliver a targeted ad, but do it alongside relevant content, you know, professional brand safe content. So I think that's going to create a, a huge opportunity for Pubmatic and, and for the open internet in general. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We've also seen kind of some transitions in kind of how tracking has worked for programmatic advertising, right? It used to be kind of all about third-party cookies. And then we see now that Google is blocking third-party cookies. Uh, Apple's, what is it, iOS 14.5 is saying there's only going to be a certain amount of time that will remain on their devices. Um, how do you see this transitioning? I, I know that you said that you work with the trade desk and we've seen their universal ID 2.0 kind of gaining a lot of traction. Do you think there's a new way that the internet's going to track user behavior? Yeah, I think there, there are going to be several new mechanisms uh, and you're absolutely right. We work closely with, with the trade desk. I think the, the headline is there's not going to be a single replacement you know, to the third party cookie or to the you know, Apple uh, you know, changing the, the availability of their ID. I think it's going to be a portfolio of solutions. And we've been investing you know, for several years now behind a portfolio. So we have a, a identity hub software that connects in with Trade Desk and their unified ID 2.0, also connects in with LiveRamp uh, and several other you know, leading identity solutions. We have uh, first party audience data solutions. So you know, if you've been uh, surfing you know, car buying websites, for instance, and maybe you're in market for, for an SUV, uh, we can target you with, you know, with uh, an SUV ad. We have contextual solutions. We're also working with Google on their privacy sandbox uh, or Flock federated learning of, of cohorts. So we don't think it's going to be one solution that replaces the cookie. It's going to be a portfolio, and we've been investing quite heavily in this area. Uh, and so again, you know, as I started at the outset, I think this is an area of huge change uh, and really opportunity. And it's our goal to lead the transition towards the, this uh, new set of solutions that, you know, that is emerging as we speak. Yeah, what an exciting opportunity right now as the industry is kind of changing directions. Uh, one more that I wanted to key you up with was connected television. You know, we're seeing a lot of people now actually having internet connected TVs. Of course, that's allowing for over the top content to be uh, served to them over a connected television. It's not just linear programmed TV. Um, I know that, that Pubmatic, you know, has, has reported this as part of your, I guess, uh, mobile and omnichannel segment. 
which experienced an 83% growth rate uh, over last year, so that's 63% of revenue. I know that mobile has been really important for you guys in several years, but can you talk a little bit about, about connected TV? Uh, is this really kind of a really fast growing division of programmatic? How important is CTV to your company? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, CTV is, is I would say, kind of the next frontier, right, of where the consumer behavior shift is happening the fastest. So it's absolutely an important area of our business. It is a very high growth area for us, and, and we're really excited about this opportunity. Uh, you know, we started building technology here a couple of years ago. We brought that technology to market uh, last summer, uh, and we've been, you know, really ramping it up uh, quite quickly. So Q4 of last year, for instance, we were working with 50 publishers in the CTV arena. Uh, fast forward to the end of Q1, so just three months, we expanded that to 80 publishers, over 80 publishers. Uh, the growth rate for us sequentially from Q4 to Q1 uh, was 55%. Uh, so it, you know, it's it's a really a, an exciting area, and I would I would characterize kind of our approach as really being focused on where the market is growing the fastest, and we think ultimately will converge, which is around biddable deals uh, and auction environments. You know, the vast majority of what's traded today, and, and again, we're still very early in the CTV transition, the vast majority of uh, transactions today are fixed price deals. You know, and we've seen this transition play out in basically in all other ad formats, display, mobile web, mobile app, online video, or short form video, uh, where the first step in the transition is to go from insertion orders, you know, analog deals to fixed price deals, and then to move from fixed price to bidded. And the reason is that when you have a bidded environment, advertisers tend to pay more because they can bid up to the true value of the inventory. And then publishers uh, generate more revenue uh, as a result. And so that's, you know, it's great for, for uh, both of the, the key stakeholders in, in the ecosystem. And I think in the last kind of earnings cycle, we heard from Roku, we heard from Disney, we heard from uh, a couple of agencies all talking about, you know, the, that shift that's coming. Uh, but I think it's also important to keep in mind that as exciting as CTV is, it's, it's one part of our addressable market. Uh, so just as, a, as an example, you know, online video, so this is, you know, short form video, not the 30 minute or kind of, you know, two hour movie uh, CTV kind of experience, but short form video is three times the size in terms of addressable market as CTV, and it's growing at a similar rate. And that's a, already a significant portion of our business and, and growing rapidly. So I think it's important to you know put CTV in context of, of the overall addressable opportunity. That's a great point. It's very lucrative, but it's still a small piece of the larger pie. Uh, if I could ask one more question about CTV, it's kind of related to how Google has changed the format of the ad auctions that they have, at least on desktop and mobile computers, right? We, we saw Google for years was just doing cost per thousand impressions, uh, with impressions being the metric, shifted that to cost per click. And then all of a sudden you get an order of magnitude in the pricing that people will pay because a click is so much more valuable than just an impression. Uh, TV is not, at least in my opinion, doesn't seem like it's there yet. It seems like we're still just watching shows or spacing out on a couch and, and watching things for a couple of hours. But do you see more interactive ads uh, being placed for connected television in the coming years? I think, uh, you know, if we look forward several years, I think that's a possibility, particularly driven by 5G, you know, transition. Uh, which always seems to be kind of 12 months away, right? So maybe it's in fact 12 months away, but maybe we'll be talking again next year and it'll still be 12 months out. But I think as, you know, bandwidth increases, obviously computing power on, on mobile devices and things like that increases as well. I think we absolutely will see, you know, more forms of interactive ads. Consumers can engage, you know, directly in the ad. You see that in, uh, in some gaming environments already today. Um, so I, I think we're definitely moving into, you know, richer ad experiences. Uh, but, you know, today, a lot of the way CTV is transacted is on, you know, viewable ad impressions. It's on the demographics of the audience. Uh, and it's, it's on, you know, airtime related to, to what, what the show is. Rajiv, our audience at Seven Investing here is individual investors, really, really interested in how markets are changing over time. It's such a unique opportunity to hear directly from your perspective as one of the innovators in this space. I mean, my crystal ball is kind of cloudy, so I'm going to ask you to look into yours. Where, where do you see connected TV, programmatic advertising, advertising just digitally in general? Where do you see this going in the next three or five years? Well, I think that's, you know, always a, a topic of discussion inside of Pomatic, right? We're always trying to divine the future and, and figure out where it's going. Uh, but where, you know, where I think we're headed is to an environment where digital advertising uh, will continue to be more ubiquitous. 
right? So one of the things that clearly happens is as the, the digital canvases evolve, right? Consumer behavior changes, right? Consumers shift their attention, mobile devices, CTV, you know, in part due to the pandemic. If I look ahead, you know, maybe there'll be self-driving cars, right? In, in five years or 10 years. And guess what? I think the outside of those self-driving cars will be wrapped in digital ads. And that'll be a great way to subsidize, you know, your ride uh, when you're going out to dinner. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, more in, in billboards, right? When you, you know, if you've been to the airport recently, uh, I have not yet been uh, post-pandemic, but, but will be soon. But there's more and more digital billboards, right, inside of airports or, or on the side of the, the freeway. So I think we're seeing, you know, more, more canvases, more digital canvases. We're seeing more engagement by consumers online. Uh, and I think we're also seeing a steady increase in the relevancy of ads. And I would argue that that's a, a net positive because, you know, a great, uh, highly relevant ad is like content, right? It, it's, it's timely, it's appropriate, you know, it, it uh, brings new information to you. And, and by the way, the more relevant the ads are, the fewer actually you need to see to make the economics of content work, right? And so that's also, I think, a, an ultimately a positive for the consumer. Well, it's so nice to be joined by Rajiv Goel. Uh, Rajiv, you know, the CEO and co-founder of Pubmatic, who's really got a great opportunity. Digital advertising is evolving quickly. They've got a ton of information and obviously very happy customers. Rajiv, it's really nice to have you on the show here today. Thanks for joining 7 Investing. Thank you, Simon. Great to connect with you and, and with your audience. And, you know, we're, we're excited about our, our future in that, uh, in that growing market. So uh, Absolutely. PUBM is the ticker for Pubmatic, <clears throat> publicly traded company. I encourage, <clears throat> excuse me, everyone to take a look at them. And thanks again for tuning into this episode of our 7 Investing podcast. We are here to empower you to invest in your future. We are 7 Investing.